الحمد لله في نعمه يكافئ مزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي للجلال وجهك العظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد اذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاولين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاخرين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملا العالى الى يوم الدين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلف الارض ومن عليها وانت خير الوالدين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر التذكير نفع انتفاع والافاده والاستفاده والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله بسنه الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلاله على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله وبرداته وخربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Inshallah ta'ala in our um, last um, session we were looking at the nature of, of the phenomenon of prophecy of prophecy that which was afforded to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and we alluded to the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one sense he underwent four um, distinct stages of, of development quote unquote one was the first we looked up was that he was a Hanif sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and we said the Hunafa are monotheists and they are monotheists who in the context of idolatry and disbelief that they consider to be deviants. We mentioned that there were several who Allah Ta'ala brought forth just prior to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and being granted prophecy. And these were people who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was familiar with. We mentioned the greatest of them, his name was Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. He's somebody who Imam Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari has an entire chapter upon who this individual was. Okay, one of the great individuals of pre-Islamic Arabia such that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about this individual, Zayb bin Amr bin Nawfal, that on the Day of Judgment he will be raised as an entire nation in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's a very important individual. He was somebody who the Prophet ﷺ was known to keep the company of in light of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was not known to keep the company of many people. I, the Prophet ﷺ was somewhat reclusive. His entire life was somewhat, he kept himself as somewhat as a recluse, somebody who was aloof from society, somebody who would prefer the outback, would prefer the wilderness, would prefer animals over human beings. Okay? But this individual, Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, was somebody well known to the Prophet. ﷺ. We even have traditions of them actually traveling together inside of Arabia, traveling together inside of Arabia. Okay? And so these people, the Hunafa, they were very important individuals, obviously. Probably the most important in terms of the tradition yani of Islam, once the revelation is granted, is Warqa ibn Nawfal. Warqa ibn Nawfal, ibn Abdul Uzza, ibn, ibn Asad, okay, who is the direct cousin of whom Khadija, Khadija bin Khuwail ibn Abdul Uzza, ibn Asad, okay, this is a direct cousin, and this is one of the first people by whom the Prophet وسلم, visits upon revelation. In terms of traditions, that he is the first person, Warqa ibn Nawfal. We have no tradition that the Prophet وسلم, between engaging Gabriel in the first descent and going back to Khadija, that he visits any other person other than Warqa ibn Nawfal. So he's a very important person. He's from the Hanifs, the Hunafa. Okay? So this is a clear, distinct stage that we see the Prophet وسلم, at prior to prophecy. And it's going to be a miraculous stage also in that Allah Ta'ala will aid the Prophet Sallallahu through multiple miracles. And those miracles are known in the science of theology as Ihrasat. Ihrasat. And Ihras is a pre-prophetic miracle. I.e. miracles that happen to prophets prior to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala granting them prophecy. The second distinct stage was the stage of Wilaya. The stage of Wilaya. And we said that if we were going to sort of try and Isolate when would this stage manifest, although the Hunafa are also awliya. But we're speaking about wilaya in the sense that we know it after what the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Bilharb as the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Allah Ta'ala where he said that whoever shows enmity towards a wali, in the awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun, verily the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they have no fear, neither shall they grieve. Okay, so this is likewise, you see, it's a distinct stage in the one Taraqi, in the ascent of the Messenger himself, Sallallahu Alaihi and this would be 38 years of age in the famous hadith of Sayyidina Aisha in Al-Bukhari, that is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This is when what becoming, yani, now a true recluse, yani, somebody who goes into absolute seclusion, 
self off from everybody, including his own family. That begins at 38 years of age with the Messenger himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's in that stage that the Prophet وسلم, begins to experience the things that the awliya of his ummah likewise experience. The Prophet وسلم, begins to see lights. The Prophet وسلم, begins hawatif. He begins in the hadith in Muslim. He begins to hear voices that come from the unseen. The Prophet وسلم, begins to speak to what? To him, um, to, to, to ahjab, ashjab, to trees and to stones, and they greet him. In the hadith of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Verily, I know stones that what kana yusallim alayya qabla an ub'ath. The hadith of Muslim. I know stones that used to greet me with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alayka, ya Rasulullah, before I was granted prophecy. That's the hadith of Sahih Muslim. Okay, so these are the things that we will see with wilayah. And one of the greatest things that you'll see in the stage of wilayah of sainthood or of, or of the, the friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the dream state, is the dreams. So the Prophet sallallahu began to have dreams and that's what Sainth Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha um, comments upon and that's going to be an important part. Why? Because not only something which again it, it anchors the Prophet sallallahu in the soil of, um, of endearment unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it's a due preparation for prophecy and that's why the hadith in and of itself Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, which is a long hadith. Aisha, um, Imam al-Bukhari, Afwan, he places it inside of the chapter, which is called How Revelation Began. So obviously that's a clear allusion to 40 years of age, as most interpretate it. But also, Imam al-Bukhari places it in a second um, chapter inside of, his, inside of his Sahih, which is in, um, in, in what's it called? Kitab al-Ta'abir, the book of the interpretation of dreams. Okay, which shows us the importance of dreams in the life of prophecy, but also likewise in the lives of those who have been well granted in endearment unto Allah Ta'ala. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith al-Bukhari likewise, he said, ذَهَبَتِ النُّبُوَّةِ وَبَقِيَةَ الْمُبَشِّرَاتِ That one Nubuwa prophecy is gone, finished. Yani, لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِ He's the final Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَبَقِيَةَ الْمُبَشِّرَاتِ but glad tidings remain. So we asked the Prophet Sallallahu what are glad tidings? And he said, Ar-ru'yatu sadiqa yarahan na'im. That it is a what? It's a true dream that a sleeper apprehends, a sleeper beholds. And another, another narration, he said, Ar-ru'yatu saliha, which would be like a good dream, a true good dream that somebody beholds. And another tradition in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu said, it's also 146th of prophecy. Because it's the window into the true world. The world of haqqaiq. So this is wilaya and the Prophet Sallallahu has this from 38 years of age when he takes to a bewildering abode which is known as al-hira. A bewildering abode by name as well as reality. Al-hira means that which bewilders, it's a bewilderment. And likewise also the reality that the Prophet Sallallahu faced inside of hira was also bewildering also. Okay, this is where the Prophet Sallallahu begins to experience the yani, grand realities and that's going to culminate in the reality of Gabriel. He experiences Gabriel on the first descent, where at Hira, he experiences Gabriel on the second descent, likewise at Hira, and likewise he also experiences Gabriel, the only time upon the face of planet Earth, where the Prophet Sassim experiences Gabriel in his true form, 500 wings, like the form that Allah Ta'ala created him upon, the only time in, in 124,000 odd occasions where they meet upon Earth, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experiences Gabriel in his true form is at that blessed place that is known as Hira. Okay, so that is going to what usher in what we know as prophecy. And that's on 40 years of age in the Hadith al-Bukhari of Sayyidina Anas, that ba'athahu Allahu ala ra'si arba'ina sana. Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik said that Allah Ta'ala granted him prophecy on his 40th birthday, tamaman, ala ra'si arba'ina sana. Imam Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says. And that brings the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to this higher degree which is known as prophecy. And we said prophecy is going to be distinguished. There's going to be things that we have to know prophecy by. And there are two things which are really important for us. One we discussed in our last session, which is wahi, revelation. That prophets are revealed unto. I mean revealed unto, like Gabriel, the great angel, he descends and he what? He then brings the word of God, the direct word of God, to the heart of the prophet, of the, of the, of the, of the object of revelation. Any human being who does not meet Gabriel in a wake state with Gabriel bringing revelation cannot be turned a prophet. 
And that is why the ulama, the theology, our theologians, they have to affirm that with somebody. They have to affirm it in order for what a person to be considered a prophet. So, for instance, in the Quran, Dhul Qarnayn, despite he's a teacher of Moses, we don't confirm him to be a prophet because we have no, we have no occasion inside of the entire corpus of revelation where he engages Gabriel with revelation. Likewise, you could speak about the Uzair, Uzair, okay, Uzair, the one who the Jews, yani, that's, that's the Jesus of the Jews, I, the Jews rendered Uzair a God besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God incarnate, Uzair, okay, we have no affirmation of Uzair, said no, Uzair, although he is without a doubt a righteous man of the tradition, a man of God, we have no tradition that what shows us that he is clearly a prophet, okay, Uzair, likewise, whom? Dhul Qarnayn, we went to Dhul Qarnayn, i.e. Khidr, Khidr, the teacher of Moses, Afwan, Khidr, or Dhul Qarnayn, both of them were mentioned inside of Surah Al-Kahf. We have no what traditions which affirm them meeting Gabriel. The only mushkila, the only problematic individual in, in entire revelation with that is whom? Maryam, alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus. She's the only problematic person. The theologians are ultimately going to settle upon the fact that women are not prophets. Okay, although Sayyidina Maryam has all of the prerequisites to be a prophet, and that's why some of the early theologians of Islam, they were, they were of the opinion that Maryam, the mother of Jesus, was in fact a prophetess, was in fact a prophetess. Okay, so prophecy, so the first is wahi revelation, the engagement of Gabriel, and that is why it's the first thing that Warqa ibn Nawfil looks for in the Prophet Sallallahu and Musa al-Akbar. That's what he says in the Bukhari. That who is this? Who is the one who's visited you? It's a namus al akbar al ladi kana yanzil ala Musa. That it's the what is the holder of the heavenly secret who used to descend upon Moses. What Akiba Nofal says. Okay, an allusion to Gabriel. Okay, I, this is a, this is a prophetic event. Okay, and then the second thing are what miracles? What are called mu'ajizat? Miracles. Prophets come with miracles by which they can be distinguished from what? Ordinary human being or fraudsters or tricksters or wizards or magicians. Prophets can be what? Distinguished by virtue of miracles that they come with. And it's very important, that's an important aspect of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the miracles that he comes with. He comes with more reported miracles, reported than any of the other prophets that we know of historically combined. The Prophet ﷺ, over 3,000 miracles, excluding the Quran, excluding the Quran, the Prophet has 3,000 recorded miracles. When we look at the Quran as a phenomena, the Quran in and of itself has over 60,000 miracles contained inside of the Quran. But outside of the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ is the Prophet of Mu'jizat, the Prophet of miracles. ﷺ. Miracles in the cone, such as the Prophet ﷺ, can split the moon, such as the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of Imam Tahawi can have the one, can have the, the sun re rise after it's set after Maghrib. The Prophet can command the sun, and the sun will, will, will rise once again after Maghrib. Miracles such as he interferes with the cone. Miracles such as the Prophet ﷺ bringing war, allowing stones to speak to him, commanding trees to come unto him, to become animate motion, move in motion towards the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Miracles such as animals speaking to the Prophet ﷺ, I and mean, he's speaking to animals, such as the gazelle that spoke to the Messenger ﷺ, such as the bear that spoke to the Messenger, such as the camel that spoke unto the Messenger ﷺ, such as a wolf that would speak unto a Bedouin on behalf of the Messenger of Allah So we see him engaging in speech, i.e. things in his environment being brought to the level of sentient beings. We see that the beings that are around the Prophet ﷺ, such as food, the things that he would eat in the hadith of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, كَانَ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ عِنْدَ أَكْلِهِ That the food used to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the Prophet ﷺ ate. Miracles of the Messenger, such as the Prophet ﷺ retaining the eyes of Sayyidina, of, of him, Sayyidina Qatada radiallahu ta'ala an, when his eye falls out at Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ can retain the eye back into its socket sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The miracles such as the Prophet ﷺ making water run profusely, Okay, from utensils or making water gush out of his fingers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a gush from his fingers. They say Moses can split the sea or Moses can make 12 different fountains come forth from a rock. But saying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can make a gush fall from his fingers, which is the greater miracle. Or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making food run profusely in pots, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can make a pot 
just flow over with food and it can feed an entire army. Or the Prophet ﷺ can even give that miracle to one individual, say the Abu Hurairah who said, I was given the Mizwat, I was given this utensil called the Mizwat that would always give me food so long as I kept it upright by the Prophet ﷺ and say, no, Uthman ibn Affan was killed, that the rebel stole my Mizwat, say Abu Hurairah says. So we could, you could keep going on about all of the miracles of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ that related to everything as an environment, although his greatest miracle, no doubt, was the character that he had and the character that he instilled in his companions. That's considered his greatest miracle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the context of the like of the Israel Mi'raj, which is just a fantastic, a magnificent event, where the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he travels the earth unto Quds, and then he goes beyond the universe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the entire cone, outwardly, as well as inwardly, opens up with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet, None of the ulama that can feign, uh, feign that fantastic and amazing and miraculous event as being on par with the event of the character of the Messenger of Allah or the character that he instilled inside of his companions. So again, so the miraculous nature of what prophets come with, miracles, true suspensions of the norm, I events that you cannot explain through the intellect, the paranormal, you see, extra what, rational events, you cannot explain them by virtue of the intellect. You cannot explain them by un, under, uh, underpinning laws or laws that underpin them realities. Like they are absolute suspensions, contraventions of every single law that Allah Ta'ala has made. Whether human beings are cognizant of that law or not, they are absolute suspensions, contraventions. So these are the two most important things we always have to keep in mind when we deal with prophets, revelation and miracles. Because they're going to help us to define who a prophet is, help us to distinguish who a prophet is. And one is not enough. Uh, you can have people who can come with many miracles, but let's speak about Gabriel. And that's important in the time of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come with miracles, and they say that the miracles of the Antichrist will become so commonplace that people will even question the reality of miracles. Uh, it's as if miracles become the law. Such that what? Something which is not a miracle could be considered a miracle, uh, if, you, if you look at it from that perspective. So he's going to come with miracles, and they are miracles. He's not a magician, he's not a wizard, but يعني, where is what? Revelation. Where is Gabriel in the equation? Okay, there's not going to be no Gabriel, so that does not allow him to be what considered a prophet whatsoever. And in fact, his miracles are for a different purpose. Allah Ta'ala's intent by the miracles of the Antichrist is to abase the Antichrist and not to raise as in the case of prophets. Okay, then messengership is becomes obviously the fourth and final stage of the Prophet Sallallahu and that stage knows no end. Every other stage knows an end. The Hunafa knows an end in Wilayah because you can have a Hanif note. As we said, you can have a Hanif, but he may not be a Wali, okay? Like, like, like the one from Ta'if, the one who didn't want it, he didn't want it, he's, 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 he's a, 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 a insult. When, he, a, a, when, he, when, he, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam manifests, he doesn't want to become a, a Muslim, doesn't want to believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because I'm from Ta'if, he's a, he's a Hanif, famous Hanif, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to quote his poetry, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, Sadaq al-Shi'ru wa kathab al-Qalbu, that is his poetry speaks the truth, but his heart has lied. So he was somebody who was a Hanif, but he never reached the stage of Wilaya. And he didn't get to the stage of the like of Qus bin Sa'id, the great one from Bahrain, or the likes of Zayd bin Amr, the Qurayshi, or the likes of Warqa bin Nawfa, the Qurayshi. They were Wahunafa, but they also were Awliya, great people with Allah Ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we say in Warqa, said, Ra'aytu Shaykh fil Jannah. I saw the Shaykh inside the par paradise, Warqa ibn Nawfa, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Qus bin Sa'id, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had a, what, a deep affinity to Qus bin Sa'id, such that when the people of, of Wafd Abdul Qais, the people of Bahrain, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, eight years after Hijrah, he said, recite his poetry unto me. Recite his poetry of Qus bin Sa'id, a great Hanif as well as a Wili. So the Hanif, the end of, of, of the Hanif is Wilaya, is the beginning of Wilaya. Whereas the end of Wilaya, they say, is the beginning of prophecy. And nobody goes beyond that except those who are granted what? The visitation of Gabriel. I, it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something you can earn through becoming somebody of Tahalli and Tahalli. Prophecy <laughs> then begins, so the beginning of prophecy is the end of Wilaya. And the end of prophecy is the beginning of what? Messengership. But the end of messengership, uh, it knows no end. 
Okay, it's something that what is unlimited, it's eternal in the ranks that somebody can ascend into. And that is why the belief of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ is continually ascending in ranks as we speak. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so we look at some of these. These are some of the people we mentioned of the four great Hunafa, Husm Sa'idah, Al Ayadi, this great individual from the Bahrain, Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, likewise great, he's Qurayshi. Uh, his, one of his great contributions to us as Muslims is his son Sa'id. Sa'id ibn Zayd is one of the ten guaranteed paradise. That's the son of Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. Waraka ibn Nawfal, the third, he's the cousin of Khadija, Qurayshi, likewise a great individual. And the fourth one, Umay ibn Abu Salt of Thaqafi, this is the one who stopped within the realms of, of, the, of the Hanif, didn't get to Wilaya, he was foul. Somebody, Allah Ta'ala, will cast into hell. Umay ibn Abu Salt of Thaqafi. Okay? Does anyone have any questions, inshallah? That was sort of was looking at, at some of the, the brief things we, we, we covered last in the last. Anyone have any questions? When we look at prophets themselves, the prophets, we just look at a base definition to see prophets, infallible, sagacious, and trustworthy male human beings that are the recipients of the revealed law, even though they are not commanded to convey it to their people. Okay, these are prophets. First and foremost, they're infallible. Infallible does not mean that they do not commit sin. It means that they cannot commit sin. Okay, they cannot commit sin by their very base constitution. That's what prophets are. I, Allah Ta'ala created them in that way. It's as if the law that Allah Ta'ala will later grant them was a law that totally concurred with their reality. They do not go against their own law. Prophets by their nature, they can't. If they tried to, they couldn't. Everyone get the point? We're just trying to stress it. It's not like they don't, like, like a wali, a wali min al awliya, a wali, he doesn't go against the law, he could, he could sin, but he has too much taqwa, too much piety, he's too much with Allah Ta'ala to go against the law, to displease Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Prophet couldn't if he tried, okay, tayyib, sagacious means they're intelligent beings, extremely intelligent beings, prophets, they operate on the highest level of human thought. The nature of what a prophet, sagacious means, by their constitution, okay, by their innate constitution. And what this, also, what this ordinarily means is that prophets ordinarily, they don't really have a nafs, like a self, a lower self, an ego, because it's ordinarily the ego that veils the intellect. That somebody can be a person of intelligence, but that intelligence can be dimmed by virtue of their ego, their nafs, their lower self. So the prophets are able to operate by their constitution upon the highest levels of human thought. Okay, the nature of prophets in and of themselves. And the third thing we mentioned that they're trustworthy. What does trustworthy mean? They cannot lie. They cannot be treacherous. Yeah, not, even with movements, they cannot be. They cannot have a treacherous movement. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he gives the example, are um, are um, a fat Mecca. A fat Mecca with the Prophet was in the conquest of Mecca, where the certain individuals with the Prophet said that they must be killed, okay, because they've committed crimes against the state ordinarily. Although there were some, their crimes against the state was what was that they spoke ill, foul about the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi So one of the individuals, what they understood, what was the rumor in Mecca? The rumor in Mecca was that if you get to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi you can get out of this. Nobody gets to him except that he forgives them. That's his nature. So people, those who were what? They had to dodge Sahaba. They literally had to hide themselves, yani veil themselves, veil their faces in disguise in order to get to the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Sahaba were, were loose in Mecca. And the Sahaba were looking for those people who the Prophet ﷺ said had to be killed like Ibn al-Khatal. Like Ibn al-Khatal, when they found Ibn al-Khatal, he's holding on to Multazim. The most sacred part of the Kaaba and the Sahaba find them because he's holding on to the Kaaba. They run to the Prophet Islam and said, Ibn al-Khatal mu'allaq bi astar al-Kaaba. Ibn al-Khatal is holding on for dear life to the Kaaba. They said to the Prophet Islam, he said, Faqatulu. He has to be executed. So he was executed. He, he went to the Kaaba. He didn't go to the Prophet Islam. Farq. Those who reached the Prophet Islam, then the Prophet would, would forgive every single one of them. This individual gets to the messenger and he asks the Prophet Islam, I seek forgiveness. The Prophet turns away, doesn't speak to him, turns away. So he runs to the other side and the Sahaba are present 
And he asks forgiveness and the Prophet doesn't answer, turns away once again. Third time he comes round in front of the Prophet and he asks for forgiveness and the Prophet says, I grant you forgiveness, you're forgiven. So the man khalas is happy and he leaves that he's been given clemency from the Prophet The Prophet then turns to the Sahaba and said that the, that the commandment was that he should be executed, that he has, a, he has a crime against the state, he should have been of those who executed. So why didn't you execute him? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, he's right in front of you. And they said to him, had you just motion towards Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a motion just with the movement of an eye, they said to the Prophet Sallallahu we would have killed him on the spot. And then the Prophet Sallallahu shows what we're speaking about. He said, لا ينبغي للنبي. It is what it is unlawful or it is impossible for a Prophet to be treacherous even with the movement of an eye. The Prophet Sallallahu said, yeah, we can't do that. Uh, طيب. So then, so likewise, we also we also say that the prophets are also male, exclusively male. We mentioned that the only one who there is a dispute over is our mother Maryam alayhi salam, Mary, the mother of Jesus alayhi salam. Okay, some of the early theologians consider her to be a prophetess, and they're human beings. They're not angels, different stock. And Allah Ta'ala, when the question was raised, why were an angel sent as prophets? Allah Ta'ala said, had we had. We sent, Allah Ta'ala speaking in a hypothetical way, had we sent an angel as a prophet, we would have made him a man, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran. Okay? So they're human beings, they're male human beings that are the recipients of the revealed law, the revelation from God, even though they are not commanded to convey it to their people. And that's important when we interpretate the theme of early Mecca. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet, he's a prophet who receives a law, engages Gabriel, but he has zero commandment from Allah Ta'ala to convey that law. The only thing prophets convey is the fact that they're prophets. So that's why when you hear the Quraysh speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, like, like the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, ah, his law has forsaken him, ah, that's what the Quraysh would, would say, his law has forsaken him. And why are they saying his law has forsaken him if, if he doesn't, they don't know he's a prophet? Well, they know he's a prophet. But he's not commanding them to a law. He's not commanding them to follow him. Just, I'm a prophet, as the, in the theologians say, Kay yuhtaram, so that people respect the fact of who, who he is. And the Quraysh did those first three years. You're not going to find the Quraysh going against the messenger. You're not going to find them what, yani being staunch, ridiculing them. You don't find this amongst the Quraysh. In fact, you find the exact opposite, that the Quraysh would send their children and their loved ones to the Prophet Sallallahu in the first three years of prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu So they did afford them the respect in those critical years. Okay, as for those who become Muslim, as you will see very exclusively, those who become Muslim, in the first three years of prophecy, and they don't become Muslim because they're asked by the Prophet, there's no da'wah, but because they request. They know who the Messenger is, sallallahu alayhi wa and they request. Okay? Those are our two types. Either essentially they become Muslim because they're the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi like Khadija to Kubra, like Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha, like Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, like the daughters of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi like saying those people who are around the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa they become Muslim on that basis. They live in with the Messenger. As for all of the others who become Muslim, and there are several of them, they become Muslim not at the hands of the Prophet, sallallahu wa but at the hands of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. The Abu Bakr al-Siddiq becomes the great da'i, Remember, he's somebody who's right from the household. So, khalas, when the Prophet Sassam tells Abu Bakr, Ana Nabi, I'm a prophet, Abu Bakr believes immediately, and what enters into the fold in the Hadith al Bukhari, everybody wavered. The Prophet Sassam and hesitated, Illa Abu Bakr. He said, Except Abu Bakr. Never wavered, never hesitated. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. Okay, so the, the nature of prophecy is that they do not convey, they're not commanded to convey, but they, they commanded to establish. A relationship with God. See, it's about their own individual ascension unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the great Imam of Egypt, his name is Izzuddin Abdul Salam, the one who's called Sultan al Ulama, the Sultan or the Prince of the Scholars, Izzuddin Abdul Salam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that prophets are greater than messengers. Or rather, I should rephrase it, he said, prophecy is greater than messengership, he says. Why? He said, because prophecy deals with the relationship with God alone doesn't deal with creation. He said, whereas messengership is about God, man, and creation. Okay, the prophets approach Allah Ta'ala, messengers approach Allah Ta'ala through human beings, through conveying the law unto human beings. So he said, on that basis, anything which is devoid of creatures, 
is better and, and focused upon Allah Ta'ala is better than that which what involves creatures. So he said prophecy is greater than messengership. What's the point we have to focus upon? This is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in them first three years. That it's about his relationship with Allah with Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with Allah. Okay? And Allah Ta'ala is good. That's why for those first three years in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will send whom? Send Israfil. The grand angel Israfil unto the Prophet That's an angel who in his entire history has never descended to earth, ever. The first time he descends to earth is after the first descent of Gabriel. And he stays with the Prophet for three entire years, as in the relating the Mustad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, and he was teaching the Prophet realities. At that same moment, that what faith saying that Adam, wa allama Adam al asma'a kullaha, in the Quran that he taught, i.e., Allah Ta'ala, taught Adam the names of everything. Likewise, the same saying of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Mustafa of Ahmed, he was engaged, he was going through this initiation, through whom? Through saying Israfil, Kana yu'allimuhu al-kalimata wa shay In the tradition, he was teaching the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the word and the entity. Okay? Tayyib. Right. What is the Prophet, what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yani, um, receive when we talk about revelation so we're looking at here in this slide revelation orality and literacy okay and the authority of, of a zuhri this is one of the great imams of medina his name is muhammad bin shihab az zuhri one of the greatest imams of medina who was asked about revelation and replied revelation is that which god reveals to one of the prophets thereby affirming it in his heart he recites it and writes it down it is the speech of god However, from it exists that which is neither recited nor written down for anyone, nor does he command its inscription. However, he delivers it unto humanity orally, clarifying to them that God commanded him to clarify it to humanity and to convey it unto them. Okay, so this is the statement of Imam Zuhri. And what we wanted to focus upon this with the Prophet ﷺ is that essentially when we speak about Mecca, and the revelation of Mecca that the Prophet Islam brings, it's an oral reality, okay, that the Prophet Islam is teaching through the word. He's not teaching through the written word, i.e. through the spoken word, and not through the written word, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi And it's in that light that the revelation we see in Surah Al-Alaq, that when Allah Ta'ala says, Iqra, that the primary signification of Iqra in the context of Mecca, as well as the context of the Prophet Islam, it means recite, and it does not mean to read. Allah Ta'ala does not instruct the Prophet Sallallahu with something that the Prophet Sallallahu is unable to do and nor does he do it after the fact Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But his signature is a Nabi Al-Ummi, that he is the oral Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he teaches through the spoken word. Okay, he does not teach through what a written word. Although this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself is going to bring into being because if we looked at it in a secular sense, he is the great educator of the Arab, sallallahu alayhi He is the one who takes them out of the world of orality into the world of literacy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not for their sake, but for the sake of preservation of the word for nations to come. Because the Arabs, until the last of them, of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, and they were oral beings. Okay, they could achieve through orality what the greatest of our time cannot achieve through literacy. Yani what they had in their breasts is what more than an individual has in their library or has read in their library and understood in their library. Okay, that's the nature of how them people were. So when the Prophet says at Badr, at the Battle of Badr, where he's teaching the Sahaba or initiates the teaching of the Sahaba how to read and write, that is more an issue of preservation for what? For those to come, for the nations to come. Understanding that this religion is going to expand to the four corners of the earth. Zuwiyat al ard he said, the entire earth has been rolled up, um, rolled up for me. And my, he said, wa the east and the west of it. And my religion shall so reach to that which I saw min maqami hada, from the place where I'm standing, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said. So we understood that in order for the religion to be conveyed successfully and to be preserved successfully to the different peoples, especially the Ajam, the non-Arabs, that what preservation was key through the actual written word. Okay, but the oral reality was what the nature of the Arab themselves, as Allah Ta'ala says, That's Allah Ta'ala's word. He is the one, i.e. Allah, God, who sent to the oral nation. 
the Arabs themselves, the oral nation, Rasulah, a messenger. Okay? So the Quran is that oral reality. Okay, when we see about the Quran, on the authority of Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Jubayr, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said, the Quran was first sent down to the lower sky in its entirety on the night of the decree existing in the constellations. Then God would reveal it to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in consecutive parts. And that's for us to understand where the Quran, the nature of the revelation of the Quran. When Allah Ta'ala, he tells us that we, yani, we sent it down, Laylatul Mubarakah, Baraka on a blessed night, Surah Al Dukhan, or Allah Ta'ala Surah Al Surah Al Im, Surah Al Im, Laylat Al Qadr, the night of the grand decree, Allah Ta'ala says, Inna anzalna hu fi Laylat Al Qadr, that we sent it down on the night of the grand decree. Okay, what is the vastly dominant opinion? Is the vastly dominant opinion that the Quran was first impacted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when? In Rabi Al Awal. Rabi Al Awal, as we said, on his 40th birthday. That's when Gabriel first engages the Prophet Sallallahu in Rabi'ah, in Rabi'ah al-Awwal, okay? Although the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is going to have two, another type of engagement, which we have to make mention of here. We mentioned that in the, in the 39th year of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that as Sayyidina Aisha says, the first thing he experienced was true dreams. And from the true dreams he experiences is the Quran in and of itself. So the Quran also impacts the Prophet Sallallahu heart as one of the great Imams whose name is Sahab bin Abdullah Tustari. Sahab bin Abdullah Tustari said the Quran impacted on Laylat al Qadr the entire heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? I was distinguishing two things. What are the two realities that are being spoken about in our tradition? The first descent of Gabriel bringing revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu and the first yani, experience of the Quran by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and they are two different occasions, two different occasions. The first, Laylat al-Qadr Sahib bin Abdullah Tustari says, what I mean by the first is what is the Quran impact, not Gabriel. And that is in Ramadan, okay? Why, how do we know that Sayyidina Aisha says, Sayyidina Aisha in Hadith al-Bukhari, that the, the revelation we know is in the Rabi al-Awwal, Gabriel. Aisha says six months prior to that, which is when, Ramadan, Six months before Rabi al Awal is Ramadan, that's when the dreams begin. And she says, Yet tika falaka subh. She says, They will come like falaka subh, like the splitting of the dawn. What does that mean? What we would call premonitions. That's what it means. Shura ibn Ajan Uda said, This is a premonition. I, whatever he sees in the dream state, then it happens outside of the dream state. Okay? So the first engagement of the Quran is inside of the dream state with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the great Imam at Tustari, and then what? It happened six months later with the first descent of Gabriel, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa arda. Okay? But then where did the Quran come from? I, what I mean by this, where does Gabriel get the Quran from? And that's what these traditions, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Jubair, there are multiple traditions that Allah Ta'ala first reveals the Quran to the Lawh al mahfuz to the heavenly tablet. And then from the heavenly tablet, the Quran on Laylat al Qadr is sent down in its entirety. Where? To what? To the first heavens. To a place called Bayt al Wa, Bayt al Izza, the mighty house, which is the Kaaba of the first heaven. It's called Bayt al Izza. Yani in it is what is Kiram and Barara, as in the Quran, the noble angelic scribes. And they were the holders of the Quran for 23 years. This was the hadith here in Al Hakim al Bayhaqi, the son of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas. And for those 23 years, Gabriel simply takes the Quran from Kiram al Barra inside of the first heaven. The Quran was first sent down to the lowest sky, that's the first heaven, to, to, to Bayt al Izza, Kiram al Barra, in its entirety on the night of the decree, which is in Ramadan. And on this Ramadan, when was it? It was the 17th. 17th. Of what of Ramadan? This one was 17th of Ramadan. Existing in the constellations, then God would reveal it to His Messenger in consecutive parts. Yani tenjiman, tenzilan. I Allah Taala would reveal it as well as the was well the occasion and required. And we have divided the recital, the Quran, so you could recite it to people in segments with logical stops. We have discharged it by sending down inspirations. On the authority of Sa'id ibn Jubayr and the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, we said the Quran was distinguished from the remembrance. Then it was placed in the mighty house at Bayt al Izza, in the lowest sky, thereby Gabriel would descend upon the Prophet with it. On the authority of Nawas ibn Sama'an, 
The Messenger of God said, whenever God speaks with the words of revelation, the sky shudders violently out of fear of God. Thus, when the inhabitants of the skies hear this, they go into a swoon and fall prostrate. Thereby, the first one to raise his head is Gabriel. So God speaks to him with whatever he desires to reveal. With he, first and foremost, reciting it unto the angels, Gabriel, as any time he passes by the sky, they ask him, What did our Lord say? He replies, Al-Haq, the truth, thereby reciting it up until the point commanded. And this is just the nature of the Quran, because the Quran is the word of God, pre-eternal, post-eternal word of God. It's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran in and of itself. So when the Quran is revealed, and what we mean by revealed is that Allah ta'ala removes the veils such that the recipient of that of those of those words of the divine can actually receive or embrace the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when then veils are revealed in the heavens, the entire heavens and its inhabitants falls into a swoon unconscious. And what they mean by that is that none in Labi Ibni is able to what? Yani engage the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say the only heavenly creature that can do it is Gabriel and that's why he is the angel of revelation this is in, in a Tabarani it's also confirmed inside of the Quran yani that when either Fuzi anhum Allah ta'ala says when the trepidation subsides i.e. The, the higher creatures the heavenly creatures they say Mada qala rabbukum. they say what did your Lord say and they call the word here kum in Arabic it's plural Gabriel is one person why did they use come for Gabriel? What did your Lord plural say? He said, Litavim. This is in order to revere Gabriel because he's the only creature that can remain conscious in the heavens when Allah Ta'ala removes the veils from his voices and that's what from his words, and that's why Gabriel says he, that's Gabriel, replies, the truth. Al Haq. He spoke the truth. And thereby reciting it up until the point commanded. I, by this, the ulama say, Gabriel then, because what's being revealed could be Quran or it could be something else that concerns the angels in and of themselves. I, what is Laylat al Qadr about? What is Laylat al Nisr Sha'ban about? What are those grand nights about? They are about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing the decree to his angels. And that's through the intermediary of the grand Namus al Akbar. What, what, what I am. Waraka called him the holder of the heavenly secret. Look at the way he called him. Then he called him Jibreel. Okay, the great archaic. He called him An Namus al Akbar, the supreme holder of the heavenly secret. Allah Ta'ala places it in the hands of the great trustworthy one, Gabriel. Who Allah Ta'ala calls him Al Amin in the Quran. Ruh Al Amin. Okay, the trustworthy spirit. Saying the Jibreel alayhi salam, that Gabriel then will go to each angel and will reveal unto them the decree as it concerns them. Because the Prophet told us that there's not a single drop of rain that falls from the heavens except that it's an angel that brings it down to where. So Gabriel will tell that angel as it concerns to him how many drops you have to bring down to where in the up and coming year. Gabriel, or the Prophet some told us about leaves, not a single leaf will fall from a tree, except that it's through the intermediary of an angel. Angels are, are more vast than the creation of God. Yeah, if you took of all of the creation together, all creation together, and placed them on the scales with angels, there are more angels than all of the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined. One of the great imams of Andalus, he says when we look at this, the, the grandness of the universe, we look at, we can speak about a hundred billion orbs in, yeah, inside another hundred billion orbs, yeah, galaxies and universes. The vastness of what modern man will speak about this creation of Allah Ta'ala. Yet when man, with all of it, his head, the size of the universe, his big head, gazes into the universe, he does see spinning basketballs. And what are they there for? What are they there for? Yeah, all of them objects spinning all around you, and all you can see is that they're spinning. But you see no life, you need to see no sub-life, you need some, no lower life, you see nothing but a spinning orb, okay? Because it's something embedded in the unseen, and one of our imams from Andalus, he said every single orb in the universe, its base minimum, mahbat lil malaika, that upon it is an angel. That's what he said on every single orb inside of the universe. So at that count, 100 billion times 100 billion, you're beginning to fathom the amount of angels that exist, Angels that are in the heavens, movement in the heavens, angels that the Prophet Israel Mi'raj said on the, on the seventh Kaaba, on, on, on what's called Bayt al Ma'mur, the Prophet 70,000 enter, never to exit. 
And then 70,000 enter, never to exit. 70,000 each and every single day, says Sallallahu How many go inside of that place? The Prophet Ibn Munabbih, the great Tabi'i, he said at the Arsh, when one of the angels, he, he, go, he falls into the, into the water, primordial water, as Allah Ta'ala says that, well, Arshu al ma that the throne of Allah Ta'ala is above water, that water is called the primordial water. He says when the angel moves, sub, submerges inside of that water and exits, he shakes himself off, the angel, and every single drop of water, a new angel is born, new angel is born, new angel is born. How many? That's why when the ulama and theologists ask how many angels exist, what is their answer? لا يعلم جنود ربك إلا هو. Only Allah Ta'ala knows the number of his soldiers. Only Allah Ta'ala knows the number of his soldiers. These are the great heavenly beings, and that's what we've got to understand, despite the context in which we may live in, where it seems like we are surrounded by kufr, we are not. We are surrounded by tawheed. We are surrounded by the glorification of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The universe glorifies Allah. In shame, as Allah Ta'ala said, there is nothing illa you said bihu bihamdi, except that it glorifies and praises Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We are fairly embedded in the Tawheedic norm. And it's these Sha'bada, it's these ragamuffins that are running loose, yani shoutings that are of yani obscenities with regards to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, should question themselves. Then when fear is gone from their hearts, they will say, What? Was that your Lord said in Surah Al-Sabah? They will say the truth, that's Gabriel, the truth Gabriel said, and it is most lofty and most comprehensive. Israfil, we mentioned Israfil, uh, messengership. We mentioned the issue of messengership. That's the hadith of Israfil for those who want to see the Israfil. Prophecy descended upon the messenger of God when he was 40 years of age. For the first three years of prophecy, Israfil, Raphael, one of the four archangels, accompanied him. He used to teach him the word and the entity and the Quran never used to descend. This is what's called Fetra Tarwahi. Gable never descended in that period of time. After three years had transpired, prophecy was now accompanied with Gabriel. Now this is messengership, the final stage. And Quran was revealed on his tongue for 20 years. 10 years in Mecca and 10 in Medina. He died when he was 63 years of age. Hadith of, of, in, in the Mustad of Ahmad. And that, the end of the period of Israfil, is the beginning of what? Of messengership. Now the Prophet has been granted the, the highest station a person could ever be granted, which is messengership. And within that, our ranks, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we preferred some over others in degrees. Mm. The messengership, which is a conduit of conveyance, that the Prophet ﷺ now is a messenger and he has to convey the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word unto humanity. Unless we forget in Allah ta'ala, Amar al mu'minina bima amar bihil mursaleen. In the hadith of Abu Hurair and Sahih Muslim, that Allah ta'ala has commanded the believers with the exact thing that he has commanded the messengers with. Okay? Commanded the same which is the conveyance of the divine word, okay, to bring everything onto that tawheedic norm, okay? On the hadith we see here of Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah, that the messenger, he heard the messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi speak about the cessation of revelation, a revelation, that three-year period when it stopped, Gabriel never descended. From amongst the things that he said was, whilst I was walking, I suddenly heard a voice coming from the direction of the sky, and it's the end of the period. So I raised my eyes towards the sky, and there was the one who visited me in Hira. Gabriel, seated upon a throne between the sky and the earth. I was immediately gripped with fear until I fell upon the ground in a swoon. Thereafter I went to my family and said, Zemiluni, Zemiluni, or Dethiruni, Dethiruni. And thus God, cover me, cover me, and thus God exalted be he revealed. O thou shrouded in thy mantle, arise and warn, come. And that word and there and warn is now the first words of what messengership, arise and warn. Thy Lord magnify thy robes, purify and defile and flee. Thus did revelation begin once again without further interruption. Okay? And this is going to be a very difficult period upon the Prophet ﷺ because now it's no longer just his relationship with Allah Ta'ala because he's ascended to the degree. But now he has to bring that unto what? Unto humanity. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ on these verses, rather than arising and warning, the Prophet ﷺ becomes a recluse once again. He actually locks himself into his house and will not go out until his aunties, the daughters of Abdul Muttalib, they're the ones who begin to what? To question the Prophet about the whole reason why once again that he's become so reclusive and the Prophet tells them what has taken place, the revelation from Allah Ta'ala for him to arise and warn and they tell, they tell him, his aunties tell him, 
go forth and do that which your Lord has commanded you to do. Okay, and that's going to be is, is bringing the Prophet Sallallahu a gathering his immediate family, gathering Banu Hashim, and then gathering Quraysh at Safa. Okay, tell you. Does anyone have any questions? Inshallah, Taala, any questions? <coughs> I was just going to ask earlier on, uh, you mentioned about also some constantly rising in uh, ranks. Could you explain that in, in terms of what ranks like, in terms of Jannah or in terms of uh, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, it's proximity unto Allah ta'ala. That's what it actually means, to, to be rising in ranks unto Allah ta'ala in terms of degrees. Okay, because the actions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not cease. Every single action that we do as Ummah do is an action that is ultimately attributed back to the Prophet ﷺ from his action. That's why they say, if you look in, in Tawheed, they say a human being has two lives, from, from this perspective, two lives. He has what we call his physical life, which obviously is going to end when the soul departs from his body. But he also has what they call Khat al-Amal. Khat al-Amal means it's, it's, a, it's a lifespan of his actions. And when do his actions finish? Okay, bilitifaq by the consent of the ulama, the actions of the human being cease upon the day of judgment, not upon his death. Okay, that's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hadith in Nasa'i, like the Prophet as an example, but the Prophet in Nasa'i, he says, "Ida mata ibn Adam," when the human being dies, in qata amaluhu, that his actions die, and what the Prophet meant, I mean, his actions finish. What does he mean? His actions finish that which come forth from him, mubasha, directly. Okay. Illa thalath. Then he says three. So by the exception, he gives us the type of actions that what do not relate to the immediate mubasha. So he says sadaqat al jariyah. He said like um, endowments, continual charity. But he said ilmu yantafi'u bihi or knowledge which other people benefit from. So like the Prophet is an example. Uh, and all the knowledge we benefit, which ultimately came forth from him. Or the Prophet said waladun salah yad'una. He said the righteous child that prays. It's a righteous child that you leave behind, that yad'u, lahu, that walk in praise for what their parent or whoever that individual was, who they left behind, doesn't necessarily have to be a parent. Okay? So therefore we have two types of actions, so it's with khat al two types of life spans. So khat al-amal, I mean khat al-amal, the lifespan of actions, how is that in relation to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because every single action that is ummah does, that has qabul, acceptance with Allah ta'ala, ultimately came forth from him in the first place. He's the guide, he's the one who guided us unto it. No. Any questions, inshallah? Mm -hmm. I want to ask about So I think that the first is, is when, when we speak about prophets, the first thing which is important because it's what's called, it's theological, isn't it? We're speaking theologically here. And so theologically, we have to um, affirm the reports beyond you know, an iota of doubt, not even reasonable doubt. That's what they call certainty. That anything that we attribute to, to a prophet, it has to come forth from a source that we are absolutely certain that is what occurred. That's the first thing, okay? So, so for instance, when we say, like, for instance, say, no, Yusuf, I mean, Yunus ran away from his people, most of that, that's going to be stuff which is not confirmed from, from any sort of source of certainty. I, when we talk about source of certainty as Muslims, we mean the Quran. I, I, it's either we find it in the Quran, or we find it in between 250 and 500 ahadith, not many, what called mutawatir ahadith. That's the only admissible evidence right now for us to base decisions upon. Okay, that's the first. And then the second is that when we find it inside of the Quran or the Sunnah, then we have to have a certain interpretation of what that means. Okay, a certain interpretation of that means. It's, it's not conjecture. We're not going to sort of, you know, have an opinion on this. So the understanding of the people of Islam, and that's why a lot of us as Muslims, because what you're saying is it's a commonly held belief as Muslims. So you're not alone in that. And we've got to ask ourselves as Muslims, where did we get that from? 
You see, where do we get that from? And what I'm going to say that if you if you grew up in a in a pure Islamic society, you wouldn't have you wouldn't hold that belief. You wouldn't hold that belief. That belief is a belief which comes about because we're immersed in Christendom. You see, that's where we've been attacked from. You see, we've been attacked either from the Christendom the sort of mindset, or from the quote unquote enlightened, you know, from the 17th century mindset. But that is not something which comes forth from our religion. So first and foremost, we question the source on it. So the belief what comes forth from our religion, which is taught by prophets themselves, and by our Prophet Muhammad is that the prophets are infallible. They not do not sin, they cannot sin. So therefore, when you see something which has the apparency of a sin, you've got to redefine your meaning of a sin. So for instance, if Sayyidina Musa kills a man, then we could ask the question, was it a justified killing? And that would distinguish between it being a sin and it being something acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, otherwise, we're going we're gonna to render Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Does anybody say Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib as an example? Who Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, yani, yani, if he killed over a thousand men, that wouldn't be an exaggeration of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. So are we anyone going to say that any one of them killings was something we'd consider a sin? I've never heard that. Anyone attributed a sin to any of the Sahaba and who killed inside of war. So I, we have a concept of a justified killing. So therefore, if, if, if non-prophets, we can understand that they have justified killings. What about prophets themselves? Okay? So Sayyidina Musa, yani it's very simple. Sayyidina Adam, did Adam sin? Which Allah Ta'ala used the word which allude to be a sin of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. What's a sin? Yani, can somebody in paradise sin? No. Why? Because paradise is, is, is not an abode of moral responsibility. Okay? So whatever somebody does inside of that environment cannot be considered the same period. Otherwise, we've misunderstood. I mean, paradise is not here. You see, paradise is no good and evil in paradise. Not there. And it, or, otherwise, we've got some type of different understanding of paradise. So St. Adam, when he does whatever he did inside of paradise, then khalas, that is what? That is not considered a sin whatsoever. Cannot be considered a sin. If it could be, then we look at the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari as an example. It's a hadith in al-Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu and said, he said, Adam and Musa were, were, were arguing. Tahaja, the, the Prophet said, Tahaja, Adam and Musa. Adam and Musa were arguing. What was Moses' issue? Moses' issue was like, you know, He's like, day of judgment, it's too dire. And Moses is like, subhanAllah. He says to Adam, that you see, we're here because of you. That's Moses. Like, all of this is because of you. And so Adam says to him, you're going to speak to me about something that was decreed 50,000 years before I did it. Yeah, this, is a, this is something that Allah Ta'ala, yeah, I had no volition whatsoever. This is paradise, some, some type of different reality. And then the Prophet Sallallahu says, فَتَحَاجَ Adam and Musa. Mo, Adam silenced Moses. Moses fell silent. Okay? So you could go on about all, all of these, these various things. If, let's say the presupposition, if, saying that, saying that um, um, Yunus, Jonah, is going to flee from his people. Like, why? Yani, didn't the Prophet Sallallahu flee from his people? What's, what's the hijrah? What's the, isn't the hijrah fleeing from one place to another? So why isn't the hijrah considered a sin? Why isn't the hijrah of Moses from, from Egypt considered a sin? Why isn't the hijrah of Ibrahim from what? From Iraq considered a sin? It's still fleeing from your people. No, but there's a commandment of God for you to flee. You got the point? Meaning it's about it's when we see the events, no doubt those, we're not denying some of them events, because some of the events are very clear in Revelation, but now how do we interpret them events in the light of who prophets are? You see, I mean, our belief that the prophets don't sin, yani, I know people who've never sinned in their life, <laughs> and they're not prophets. And if I can know a person who in his entire life has never sinned, we know people who have never sinned in their lives and they're dead ever. Ever, ever, <laughs> like I, I, met, I met a Christian once, a Christian woman once, and she said, Ah, oh, I can't believe all that stuff about Jesus. I said, What, what stuff can you, you believe about Jesus? She says that Jesus never got married. I know men, that's what she said. I know men, all men have the age, and nah, I don't believe all that stuff in the Bible. I said, Kaif, yani, yani, like a man cannot live an entire life without having that age. A man cannot live an entire life without getting, ever getting married. 
cave Kalan. I mean, that's where you reduce your whole sort of worldview. It's a really sad worldview to have, Yanni. You know, people like that exist, and they will always exist. And if they can exist, when they just follow the prophets, what about the prophets themselves? And I just propose one thing for those to understand, that we have zero frame of reference for prophets. We really don't understand who prophets are, Yanni. We don't. And I think when you hear, like someone which came to me yesterday, it's similar to somebody, I think on one of these, these um, Islamic sort of chat lines, whatever they were, speaking about him, um, Yanni, you know, we, can we become hired and companions and all that type of stuff? And can somebody get closer to Allah Ta'ala than companions? The first thing is you don't even understand what a companion is. Why? Because you don't understand what a prophet is. You don't understand what them beings are. You don't want to understand to be in the presence of those human beings. We have no frame of reference. We have references for like really lower, lower, lower human form, which we see upon the earth today. Lower form. Such that then people become, read, there's, a, there's an interesting, if people want to see cultures, there's, a, there's an interesting individual, his name is, um, what's his name? Wade Davis, Wade, W-A-D-E, Davis. Just, just Google Wade Davis or YouTube Wade Davis, and he's an anthropologist who just travels around the world, living with, with different cultures. You know when you, just from where we're from, listen to some of that stuff, as like the Polynesian culture, like he, he spoke in one lecture about Polynesians, those are like the, the Pacific Polynesia, 